Okay. Yep. Okay. Set up there. We ready? Oh, uh, I guess we're going to do play. Hey, Kevin, we can't see anybody there. Okay, we're getting it. We're coming on. We haven't been there. Uh, it's up to you. Yeah, I think we ought to do it. You know what? You can have a moment of silence. Whatever you, whatever you want. Larry and I are flexible. You know you've been missing it for a long time. I know. The next guy won't be near as much fun. You're, we'll, we'll actually conclude our meeting, and then it will just be a budget presentation. All right. Are we ready? Yeah. Yep. Should be ready. All right. Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to. Uh, this historic meeting of the Garrett County Commissioners as it is our first meeting back in uh, the courthouse with an audience. Um, before uh, I do want to call this meeting to order before we do anything else I'd like everyone to please stand with me to recite the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, and if everyone would please remain standing. Um, one year ago today, uh, Garrett County shut our courthouse down due to COVID-19 uh, as part of our beginning of our response to the pandemic. Uh, so it is symbolic that we reopened it today uh, with an audience. So I want to thank everyone that, that came out today and everyone that's tuning in. Uh, if we could, at this point in time, I would like to have a moment of silence uh, to recognize and commemorate all of those who perished during this time uh, in our history. Thank you. Please be seated. I'm recording here, Mr. Chairman, one second. Mm, Kevin, I'm, there went all that faith we had. I know I'm there. live, but I'm not recording. So, <clears throat> Mr. Nall, do we have any additions, corrections, or changes to the public meeting agenda? No, sir, I do not. Hearing none, do we have a motion to approve the public meeting agenda? So moved. We have a motion. We have a second. Second. Motion to second agenda approved by mutual consent. Everybody got a copy of the minutes in advance of the meeting. Are there any additions, corrections, or changes to the minutes? Hearing none, we have a motion to approve the minutes. Motion to approve. We have motion, we have a second. Second. Minutes approved by mutual consent. Uh, the first item on the agenda is, uh, as usual, is our COVID-19 update. And we have uh, Bob Stevens with us uh, online. So Bob, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, and it's uh, nice to see that you're able to uh, be back in the courthouse. Um, I, the report today is kind of a mixed bag. Bag. There is some good news and some bad news. Um, I'll start off, I think, with the bad news uh, that uh, we have um, uh, currently 1,874 cases have been identified in Garrett County, and uh, we now have 61 deaths that are uh, uh, COVID-related. And um, over the last 10 days, we went from having the lowest positivity percentage uh, in the state and the lowest case rate in the state to the highest in both of those categories. So our current case rate is 12.8 uh, um, per thousand. And the uh, current positivity rate is 6.41. Um, the uh, the virus is continuing to circulate and we must really be careful. Um, we know that uh, for the most part, that about 10 days after a case rate goes up, which it just did, that's when we begin to see hospitalizations. And then about 10 days after that, sometimes we see deaths increase. And um, 
Right now, there's a, a lot of precautions because there are some variants. There's a great Britain, Britain strain, uh, B117, and a South African strain, uh, B3151, that's circulating uh, in the United States, as well as there are very own American grown uh, New York and California strains that are, um, in some cases, more contagious. Um, so it's important that we continue uh, to keep testing. We want to encourage people to do that, especially if anyone traveling outside of Maryland uh, or its contiguous states. Uh, that's not required now uh, as of 5 uh, p.m. on last Friday, but it is the prudent thing to do. Uh, the, the tests help us to gather information on uh, variant strains and, and some of the labs um, that are used are able to provide genomic testing uh, for the variants. Uh, so you can see if it's uh, made its way into Garrett County. And so uh, we don't know of that yet, but our, the uh, lab that the Garrett County Health Department uses uh, does uh, do that genomic testing. Um, we all wanna get back to normal as soon as possible. And it seems like the goalposts are being moved sometimes, but the reality is the longer the vaccine circulates, the more important it is, uh, or the more opportunity it has for it to mutate. And so that's why it's really important that we stay vigilant. Um, uh, there is uh, still a lot of uncertainty in, with uh, regard to the direction of the pandemic. Uh, while there's light at the end of the tunnel, there are st still some huge risks uh, with these emerging uh, variants. And that uh, has to do with a lot of the uh, problems that we have greater risk. And you complicate that with what we call pandemic fatigue because Everybody wants to get back to normal. Uh, and you know, we we've learned to live with this. And so living with it, we you know, we can uh, continue to let our guard down a little. Uh, and uh, so the faster um, that individuals can go back to normal, the greater the risk is to the population of individuals that, who are not yet vaccinated. So we want to be careful uh, with that. Um, as far as restrictions, uh, last week, Governor Hogan rescinded uh, many of uh, the restrictions. Uh, most people were happy to see the opening of uh, businesses and schools, and uh, it's important to get our businesses and schools back up and running. Um, uh, he, with, through executive order, he did away with the uh, maximum occupancy and limitations on churches and restaurants and bars, uh, but there's still a requirement of a six foot distance and face masks. So some, some of those, uh, businesses and churches still may have to be limited because of that six foot distance. Um, and uh, one of the things that uh, we've just observed is that uh, immediately people began to let their guard down and we're seeing uh, uh, a little more difficulty with people complying to face masking. And um, when people are gathering together, we're seeing people uh, shake hands, which we hadn't seen in, in a year, uh, rather than elbow bumps. And, and so, that's just showing that people are beginning to let their guard down. Uh, the majority of the new cases in the last, uh, uh, that we've seen in the last 10 days have been since the restrictions were modified. So we, re we began to see that, that um, increase um, on Friday. Um, and so there does uh, seem to be a correlation. Um, <clears throat> our primary risk at this time is really human behavior because the governor shifted from having legal consequences and put it back on personal responsibility. So we want to encourage everybody uh, to be as responsible and, uh, and uh, you know, be as vigilant. Um, in, in October, we uh, first saw the spike in cases, and then we saw, once again, hospitalizations and then deaths. And it's important that we fix this bump in this road because when, when I say that we've seen a spike, it's really, you know, um, 20, 25 cases. Um, that's not a lot. Uh, and it's really important that we use these uh, face covering and, and keeping the distance uh, in order that we keep this uh, bump in the road from becoming a sinkhole. Um, currently, we're at fully at uh, phase 1C. 22.6% uh, of our population has received at least one dose of the vaccine, and 14.6% uh, are fully vaccinated. So they've either had two doses of the uh, mRNA vaccine, or uh, just today we, uh, we vaccinated 70 individuals with the uh, Johnson & Johnson vaccine. Uh, the vaccine still is available at Walmart and Walgreens and CVS, um, the health department, uh, Mountain Laurel, uh, 
Garrett Regional Medical Center for, uh, for their staff and for their discharges to long-term care. So it, it is uh, becoming more available here, uh, but it's in limited supplies to all of those locations. Nobody has an unlimited supply at this time. Uh, the health department is continuing to get 300 uh, doses a week, and we expect that that may increase. Uh, the, the health department's role is to put a premium on vaccinating uh, special populations. And so we began uh, keeping an interest list uh, just last week. Um, it's not a waiting list, but people get on that list and we use it to prioritize. So we make sure that we get that the health department is getting it, the vaccine in the arms of those pe individuals who are at, at most at risk or most likely to uh, spread it. Um, the state's gonna uh, plans on opening the mass vaccination site in Hagerstown next week. Uh, they've reserved 250 doses for Garrett County residents. And so we'll see how many of those doses uh, are used. Uh, but I would say that uh, if, uh, people who want that vaccine, uh, want the vaccine who are in a lower priority group, uh, younger population, uh, if they can make that, uh, that trip to Hagerstown um, and register for that uh, vaccine, then uh, that would be a good thing to do. And we will post that information on our website. Um, so right now it's really a race against time uh, because of these contagious variants that are circulating. Um, currently, we have vaccinated 65% of those individuals in the county who are over 85 years old, 69% of the people from 75 to 84, and 53% of the people from 65 to 74. So we're really doing a, a pretty good job uh, making sure we get those uh, people who are at most high risk. Uh, but remember, uh, these people who are being vac vaccinated they are the people that we're getting those vaccinations uh, to that group because that protects them the most. But ultimately what we need to do is be able to um, get the vaccination to as many younger people as po possible because that's what will uh, help uh, stem uh, the spread of the uh, virus. So that's, uh, that's my report today. Um, do you have any questions? Bob, I don't have a question, but I do want to mention uh, for those people that read the Republican last week and saw that we were named in the, the lawsuit um, filed against, uh, I think it was five counties, correct me if I'm wrong, we were named as one of those. Uh, but through your work uh, and, and our attorneys, uh, upon further review, they actually agreed uh, to withdraw us from that lawsuit because they uh, reassessed their uh, decision that we didn't do a very good job and actually were very complimentary of the job the health department did. So I wanna, wanna mention that as a tip of the cap to you, but also anyone that's watching to know that we were released from that uh, and that uh, by their admission, uh, you guys at the health department actually went above and beyond the call of duty and reaching out to uh, selected populations, and, and that's noteworthy, and uh, just wanted to, to make sure people were aware of that. One question. Yeah. Uh, thank you for that, Commissioner Edwards. We, um, yeah, we, what we did was we worked with community partners, and it was, uh, uh, we were reaching out to those uh, individuals who are intellectually and developmentally delayed, and uh, so we reached out to them personally through, the, through our partners, and we have a vulnerable population a committee uh, within Garrett County. And so we really did, a, a, I think, an outstanding job. What we for, we did not do is on our website, uh, we did not put the vaccine was available for priority to intellectually and developmentally dis, dis, um, disabled. And so we made that correction. They pointed it out to us. We wish they would have pointed it out to us before they uh, put us in a lawsuit. But once once we made that correction, everybody was happy. Hey Bob, do we do you know how many doses each of the pharmacies gets on a weekly basis? Um, we do not. I believe I believe Walmart is getting two hundred. Walgreens and CVS are part of the federal um, uh, uh, vaccine program, and so they um, it really helps us out in Garrett County because we get a what's called a pro rata uh, allocation based on our population. Well, 
by receiving some in Walmart and CVS, uh, whatever they get is above and beyond that. So we're really fortunate that uh, that that is being provided. And um, I think with all of the, the providers, what I have noticed is that usually, um, you know, they'll, they'll get it in. Uh, they're, they're similar to us. They get it in within a couple of days that they're, they're back to they don't have any. And then, you know, a few days later, they have it in again. And so, you know, um, we, um, we uh, really want to work with those uh, pharmacies and, uh, you know, with the health department, because as many locations as uh, can, vaccine can be distributed, uh, the, the more we can get out there, the better. We, it would be great if it was um, in, in every, you know, mom and pop store in the county, but that's not going to happen, but we'd like to see that. One other question. Have you, have you gotten complaints about the criteria that the pharmacies are using to determine who gets the shot? Um, not, not necessarily. I, I think, uh, you know, some of the pharmacies are doing a, a very good job of trying to stay within the uh, phases that the state has. But again, those are the, the vaccine that they're receiving is through the federal program. And, uh, and so, you know, the, the complaint we get more often than not is somebody who says, well, you know, they, they have a, a very good reason for getting the vaccine, but they don't fit into the specific population that the health department has, uh, uh, is directed to use. And so we're really directed toward uh, making sure that vulnerable populations are vaccinated in a very systematic um, way. And so that makes it difficult for some people who really need it but they don't fit into one of our categories. So sometimes, um, you know, the pharmacies are a better route to go for those individuals. Okay, thank you. Any other questions uh, for Bob? All right, Bob, thank you very much. We appreciate it. Keep up the good work. Okay, thank you for your support. All right, uh, next item on the agenda, we do have a proclamation and uh, I'm pleased to say that we are joined uh, in this meeting virtually by Jason Keeling, the executive director of the uh, American Red Cross in uh, our region. So uh, Mr. Keeling, welcome. And uh, I'll go ahead and read the proclamation and then I'll turn it over to you, sir, for any comments. So uh, this proclamation for the American Red Cross Month, uh, whereas March is American Red Cross Month, a special time to honor the kindness of our neighbors who aid families in need locally across the United States and around the world. Their dedication touches millions of lives each year as they carry out the organization's 140 year mission of preventing and alleviating suffering. Whereas during the trying times of coronavirus pandemic, people have stepped up to help others in need whether responding to this year's record-breaking disasters across the country or rolling up their sleeves to give blood when our country faced a severe blood shortage. And whereas local families have relied on volunteers for comfort and hope while coping with disasters, the Red Cross and its local volunteers helped over 700 families impacted by home fires in the central Appalachian region and several in Garrett County by addressing their urgent need for food, lodging, and recovery support. And whereas volunteers have supported local families in other ways too, Last year in Central Appalachia region, Red Cross collected over 30,000 units of life-saving blood while providing COVID-19 antibody testing to every donor and provided nearly 3,000 services to military members, veterans, and their families. And whereas this life-saving work is vital to strengthening our community's resilience, nearly 200 years since the birth of the American Red Cross founder, Clara Barton, we dedicate this month of March to all those who continue to advance her noble legacy. And we ask others to join in their commitment to care for people in need. Now, therefore, we, the Board of Garrett County Commissioners, recognizes the significance of the American Red Cross and does hereby proclaim March 2021 as Red Cross Month in Garrett County and urge our citizens to commend this observation. Our community depends on the American Red Cross, which relies on volunteers and the generosity of public to perform its mission. Signed by Commissioners Heimball, Titchenau, and myself. And uh, again, Mr. Keeling, welcome and thanks for joining us. Thank you, commissioners. I appreciate the op opportunity just to tell you a little bit about this proclamation and the work that we're doing in your community. Um, again, I am the executive director for what's called the Allegheny Highlands chapter of the American Red Cross, which includes Garrett, um, Allegheny, 
um, all of the surrounding counties to you in West Virginia, in addition to, to various other counties in West Virginia. Um, last year, our boundaries changed a bit where we're now serving your county from Morgantown, where I'm located. Uh, previously, we'd done so out of Hagerstown, so just a little closer to you in terms of the headquarters that we're serving you out of. This proclamation that you've just adopted, which we greatly appreciate, is a tradition that's occurred actually uh, since uh, uh, President Teddy Roosevelt and um, annually has happened uh, and been declared by President since and other public bodies as a way to feature and recognize the work that we do. So just to let you know in your county some of the statistics, um, last year, um, 2020, we collected almost 1,400 units of blood and distributed in Garrett County. We provided um, emergency services or services to the armed forces to in 25 cases in Garrett County. And primarily what that is, is the U.S. Department of Defense contracts us so that if there is a uh, an emergency that a member of the armed services has, say their family has an emergency and they're deployed to another part of the world or country, we're the agency that verifies, yes, an emergency has happened and this service member should be released. We also make sure that veterans um, have their full benefits. Um, and um, so those are some of our service to the armed forces. Uh, we, of course, um, provide um, CPR and first aid training, and um, we respond to natural or to disasters. Uh, the primary disaster that we respond to, um, other than flooding, is uh, a home fire. And in your county last year, we responded to three home fires, which is a little bit lower than normal, um, but we were there to make sure that those residents that were affected had their immediate needs met, that they had food, that they had clothing, and that you know they had um, um, uh, psychological support. Uh, in fact, uh, we try to be the best part of someone's worst day. So just want you to know that um, we are serving your community, even though we might not have that bricks and mortar presence there. Uh, whenever we get the call that there's a, a disaster and that um, people are in need, then we deploy volunteers and staff to, to ensure that that service uh, is delivered. And so that's my general comment. And hopefully at some point I can visit with you uh, in person. Again, our, our changeover in terms of our boundaries happened in April of last year, of course, the height of uh, the pandemic um, and its uh, onset. So that's why you haven't, I haven't had a chance to visit with you in person, but we really appreciate um, this virtual opportunity. So uh, any questions? Otherwise, thank you. Any questions? Well, thank you very much, and thanks for all you do for uh, our county and the surrounding area. Thank you for joining us. Yes, sir. Appreciate it. All right. Next order of business, uh, we have uh, an announcement and a presentation by CPV Solar. Uh, we're joined uh, today by John Hafner, Ryan Lockhart, and Steve Sullivan. And uh, I'll turn it over to, to you guys. That's like his hand. Uh, it might be best to come up uh, front here. Right here. Yep. Yeah, that's fine. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, let me get, I uh, can't do both of these, so let's try this. Kevin, things have been going pretty well so far. Well, <laughs> 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 Not wrong one. I can go ahead and get started on the, the presentation. Yeah, sure. um, so my, as you said, uh, first, thank you so much for having us here. Uh, it's a pleasure to, to be able to be here in person um, to, to meet you. Uh, I'm John Hafner from Competitive Power Ventures. I'm joined by Ryan Lockhart and Steve Sullivan. Uh, we're here to speak with you today about the CPV Backbone Solar Project um, and also to introduce CPV in general. Um, so Competitive Power Ventures Company, uh, we've been developing power projects across the United States for over 20 years. Um, 
We were founded in 1999, and uh, one of our co-founders is still our CEO today. Uh, we've uh, we've had a presence in Maryland for a long time. Our uh, our company headquarters is in Silver Spring, Maryland, and we've also developed and own the St. Charles project, uh, which is a large combined cycle power plant in Charles County, Maryland. Uh, and actually even a little closer to here in Cambria County, Pennsylvania, we have another large combined cycle power plant. That's the CPV Fairview Energy Center. And we're also working on a solar facility there, which is the CPV Maple Hill solar facility. Um, so we've done a lot of work, you know, both in this state and in the region nearby. Um, you know, we, we have three core businesses at CPV. One is the development of you know, large-scale thermal you know, gas-fired power projects. Uh, as I, I mentioned, two of those, the St. Charles Project and the Fairview Project. You know, we've done a number of those projects throughout the United States. Uh, those are supporting uh, a, a large number of homes and businesses with, with low-cost, low-emission power. Uh, we also do asset management. Effectively, we step in and act as the owner for other folks' power projects. Um, this happens uh, if some power project becomes financially distressed and the bank ends up taking ownership of it, we step in and act as the owner for that, that bank. Um, and then the third line of business, which is what brings me here today, is we also develop renewable power projects. Uh, we've done a number of wind power projects throughout the central part of the US. We're also working on additional wind projects uh, throughout the country. And we're working on a number of solar power, solar power facilities throughout the country as well. Uh, you can see here um, kind of our, our the areas that we've been working over the years, and, and they're they're pretty significant. Uh, you know, the, the light blue dots on this map are areas where we've had you know, large combined cycle power projects. Um, those are powered by natural gas. You know, the, the green areas are the areas where we've done a lot of historical uh, wind work as well. Um, as we're I'm talking, I'll probably mention uh, kilowatts or megawatts or gigawatts a lot, just to kind of put that into perspective a little bit more. Uh, the average U.S. household uses about 10 megawatt hours per year. Um, the facilities that we've brought online since 2010, you know, 5.2 gigawatts, that's over 5,000 megawatts of capacity. Um, so at any given hour, those facilities can produce 5,000 megawatts. So that means the facilities that we've brought online since 2010 are capable of you know, powering millions of homes in the United States. Um, we've also done a lot of asset management, as I mentioned before. We've managed uh, over 21 gigawatts or 21,000 megawatts of facilities. And those include our own facilities and a number of other facilities that, that are owned by others. Uh, I'm here to talk about solar today. Um, tried to bring in some representative pictures for you to see of solar in you know, more challenging terrain. I think most of the time when you see pictures of solar, it's in kind of a flat farm field. You know, we're, we're uh, our project is on a reclaimed coal area. It's got some hilly topography. And, you know, because of that, I wanted to show you, you know, just some, some representative photos here of what that can look like. I also wanted to mention some quotes. Um, you know, like I said, we've we've done projects you know, near this location, Charles County, Cambria County, uh, and our projects throughout the country. We always try to become members of the community. Um, we we know that we're going to be there for years, for decades. Um, so it's important to us that every time we enter a community, we enter as a good neighbor, and then after we've built the project and we're operating a project, we can come back to this community and hope that you'll be able to give us a quote too that says, you know, we came here, we said we're gonna do these things, this is how we're gonna conduct business and this is how we did it. Um, and that, that's, that's really what the gist of these quotes are here is that every, every community that we go into, um, you know, we've been a good neighbor in that community and you know, we contribute to each of those communities that we're in. Um, We've also, you know, been in great. You've been been building ourselves up to get to know folks in this community as well. We've had opportunity to meet with the Greater Cumberland Committee. Uh, just today, we were meeting with some of the nearby landowners to the site to talk with them about the project as well. 
So the backbone solar facility, um, I'll jump to the picture here real quick. So just to get a sense of, of where we are in Garrett County, uh, the Criterion Wind Project is just to the southwest of us. Um, this is uh, about 2,000 acres is in that purple, purple line there. Uh, that's going to support 175 megawatt solar facility. Um, so that 175 megawatts of solar, that produces over 300,000 megawatt hours of electricity per year. So going back, that's about 30,000 homes per year, which is more than twice the number of homes in Garrett County. Um, you, you can see here on the site, uh, we've got a transmission line running right through the site. That means we don't need to build any new transmission. So there's, there's not gonna be any new overhead transmission lines associated with this site. Everything is gonna be very contained. And you can kind of see on here, this, this site is a, is, a, is a reclaimed coal mine. Uh, it was deep mined back in the 40s and the 50s. And much more recently, it was mined by Arch Coal, who has reclaimed it. Um, so the, the, the old purpose of the, of the site you know, for, for coal mining, that's really kind of gone through everything it can get through. Now we can repurpose that site and continue to, to utilize it um, to benefit the community. Uh, so you can see here, and when you look on the map, all the kind of step away from the mic here. Yeah. All this area here where you can really see that all the trees are gone. That, that's that's area that was that was reclaimed coal mine. So the large portion of the site is that reclaimed coal and the rest of the site, you have a lot of trees kind of surrounding everything. So it's a very well secluded area. Um, at the same time, it's a heavily impacted area from from all that previous work. Go back up here to previous slide. So this facility I mentioned is 175 megawatts. That's uh, over $200 million investment into the community. We plan to start construction um, next year, a little over a year from now. Uh, we started working on the project about a year ago. Uh, and this project's moving along rapidly. Two years for an energy project is, is a pretty rapid pace, but this project's been, uh, been really great. Every environmental study we come back, we've done has come back positively. Um, construction is expected to last about 14 to 16 months. That puts us in a mid to late 2023 completion of construction. We've gone through uh, a lot of permitting work so far, and you'll see that in a couple slides. Uh, we've done a lot of studies. We've worked with a lot of the state agencies already to, to identify the areas of the site that are areas of concern and avoid those areas so that we avoid environmental impacts. So here it is. Um, we've gone through uh, a, whole, a whole list of studies, um, you know, geotechnical studies, forest studies, glare studies, wetland studies, all, all of these to identify where are, the, where are the areas of concern. And then you know, we've worked with a number of state agencies and federal agencies to identify where those problems are and how we can, how we can avoid impacting those areas. Um, and you can see that on this map here, uh, this map, shows both constraints for the site and it also shows the solar layout that we have. So everything in blue here, so all this blue area here, that's all paneled area. And then you can see a number of constraints that we put on this map. You can see the light blue um, creeks and streams that flow through the site. Those are all areas that we're completely avoiding impacts um, and we're putting buffers on those. You can see the orange dots that go through one of those. That's it. That's an area of a uh, of a habitat concern for one species that the state mentioned to us. So we're avoiding all of those areas. Um, you, you can see you know, all of these areas are just areas that we're avoiding the environmental impacts and really putting the project uh, in, in the best location possible. Uh, we've also, I mentioned where you don't have any new transmission line. Right here, you can see these two boxes. That's the substation on the site. So we're just gonna break the transmission line where it is and feed directly that power directly into the grid. As I mentioned, the project's a $200 million investment. We expect that's going to provide significant you know, local tax revenue. It's also going to provide a number of construction jobs for the, for the local community. Um, you know, between about 14 and 18 months of construction, we expect you know, 150 to 200 jobs. And you know, we've already been working with a lot of Maryland agencies and Maryland companies, um, specifically for engineering work, 
for preparing our permits. Um, so there's, there's been a number of Maryland uh, companies already employed by this project. Number of environmental benefits as well. As I mentioned before, um, this was both deep mine and strip mine, and now we're, we're repurposing it and reutilizing it to continue to, to benefit the community beyond that. Um, the reduction, significant reduction of carbon emissions, the equivalent of 50,000 cars coming off the road. And as I mentioned before, it's you know about 30,000 homes of power. Um, that's, that's low cost power going on the electric grid. That's the, the heart of the presentation. I'd be happy to answer any questions that you have on the project. Um, I understand I, from your slide and talking to local folks, I talked with some people at Pillar of Bite, so I think they're gonna be involved in this in some capacity, or at least in talks with that. Is that accurate? Can you, who, who is that? Pillar Innovations and Bites will, uh, they're local companies. Local companies for Pillar the construction and-, and uh, Mr. Jason from the Oh, it, oh, oh uh, we have we've spoken with the, the uh, Greater Cumberland Committee, and, and if we plan to join that organization, um, we have not selected a specific construction company at this time for the project. <clears throat> and my good friend uh, Mayor Record from the town of Kitzmiller is in the back. Uh, have you guys reached out since this will be the closest town involved? Would be Kitzmiller. Has there been any conversation with uh, the town uh, at all? Yes, we, yep. we've uh, spoken with the mayor a few times now. Um, had, had a chance to give him the same presentation that gotcha. we gave you and answer his questions on the project as well. And I understand they're in support of the project. So that, that's good. I, I think it's a great idea. I like the location. It makes a ton of sense for a lot of ways. So I'll turn it over to you guys if you have questions. But they, these projects, I know downstate, are, <clears throat> can be pretty controversial, particularly when you go to put them on green space or farmland and there's a lot of zoning issues and stuff. But it, as Commissioner Edwards just said, I think the fact that you're utilizing a, a um, reclaimed strip mine, it's a perfect spot for it. I, I'm just roughly how many acres will it be? Do you, maybe it's there, I just didn't see it. I, yeah, if you looked at that purple area that I had yeah. up on the map, that was about 2,000 acres. The actual land use by the panels is probably going to be somewhere like 1,100 acres. Okay. And, and without divulging any proprietary information, how did you come across this site? Do you look at the distribution network and see where they're, how, how did you come to this place? Yeah, so um, the MDE, uh, the Maryland Department of Environment, uh, has been encouraging developers to look for reclaimed coal mines okay. for uh, for new projects. So we 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 have been looking at opportunities to reclaim coal mines. You know, we saw that this was you know, a large project. You know, if one or two landowners really could 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 provide a, a significant amount of land to support the project. Um, we saw that it was nearing the end of its reclamation. It was actually the, re the reclamation process was just signed off by the state in February. That's great. Um, so, so, so we saw that it was kind of nearing the end of that process. Mm -hmm. We studied the electric transmission grid and we, we realized that this is a pretty likely, uh, that this, this line didn't have a lot of overloads on it. Um, some other parts of the state, uh, the transmission lines can be pretty overloaded. So trying to interconnect to the transmission is very difficult. Um, you know, here, this, this is a lightly loaded line, so we're able to interconnect and inject the power into the grid without causing overloads to the system. Good. Thank you. Anything Thank you else? Great project. Yeah. Thank you. I really did. Thank, Thank you very much. Is there, is there any other areas in the county that you know of that are pursuing any projects like this? Um, I, I think we, we, we may explore that. Um, I think we're, we're, we're really focused on this project here. We think, we think this is a, a fantastic project, um, but th there, there may be other areas of the county that, that can see um, something similar. So we're, we're hopeful that, like I said, you, we've been, you know, as a company, CPV has been working on solar projects uh, you know, in a lot of different areas. Uh, so we continue to look for, for more projects that might, might pick good opportunities. So Scott, have you already done estimates about what kind of tax revenue we'll get from it? Rough estimates, yes. <laughs> they, just so they know what they don't want to surprise them. <clears throat> I'm sure they have too. I'm sure they have too. <laughs> yeah, that's I'm fair. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank any you very other, much. Any Thank other you. questions or comments? 
thank you guys for coming out today. Appreciate it. Uh, thank you for having us. Look forward to partnering with you and seeing where we can go with this. So thanks. Thank you. Okay. Um, next item on the agenda is Garrett County Purchasing Department. Uh, we've got, I think, one bid. Uh, Mr. Nall, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Can I get copies of those? Oh yes, sir. So uh, this is for this is bid uh, number twenty one zero three zero four, prefabricated steel bridge for the Snowy Creek Road. Um, we received three bids uh, for this project. Uh, Contact Engineering Solutions in the amount of three hundred two thousand nine hundred and ninety two dollars. Acro Corporation of America in the amount of three hundred and thirty four thousand one hundred dollars and U.S. Bridge in the amount of $369,789. Um, the Purchase Department is recommending awarding uh, bid number 210304 to the apparent low bidder, uh, contact, contact Engineered Solutions in the amount of $302,992. you uh, remember what the budgeted amount for this was? Yeah, so the bridge itself came in under budget of about $42,000. The overall project is $641,859. Any questions uh, for Mr. Nall? Hearing none, we have a motion to accept uh, the recommendation from the purchasing department on bid number 21-0304. Uh, the Snowy Creek Bridge to Contact Engineered Solutions in the amount of three hundred two thousand nine hundred ninety-two dollars. Make a motion to accept that. Yeah. We have a motion. We have a second. Second. Motion. A second. Question. On motion. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed. Motion carries. Uh, next item uh, on the agenda is the uh, Garrett County Salary Study Review uh, recommendations. I have those recommendations here. And I want to uh, publicly thank all of those who participated in the salary review. So the uh, recommendation of the board uh, to the board of county commissioners from the Garrett County Salary Study Commission. Um, there are six of them, sort of. Uh, first was the Board of Garrett County Commissioners. There was no increase in salary requested or recommended. Uh, the second one was for Judge of the Orphans Court of Garrett County. The commission recommended a $2,000 increase for each member. Uh, the chief judge from $4,500 to $6,500 and judge from $4,200 to $6,200. And the commission recommends a flat rate of $119 a day for training in addition to mileage uh, reimbursement. The third one, uh, the sheriff for Garrett County, no increase in salary requested or recommended. Uh, the fourth one was Garrett County Board of Education. The commission recommended a $1,500 increase for the president of the Board of Education and $1,000 for board members, president, each election cycle increase from $200 to $400 per day and a canvas stipend for each day work two days each election cycle from $50 per day to $150 per session. And the final one is the Garrett County Liquor uh, Control Board, no increase in salary requested uh, or recommended. So we have uh, in actuality three uh, recommendations for uh, from the Salary Study Commission, one for Judge of Orphans Court, one for uh, Garrett County Board of Education, and one for uh, the Board of Election Supervisors. Uh, any questions com <clears throat> or comments or discussion on those recommendations? So uh, I have an issue and the board members are here, so with the uh, Garrett County Board of Education. Um, as far as the, the increases for the board members themselves, I have no problem with that. 
uh, increasing the president uh, up uh, to $1,500 more. I know we've talked about this with ourselves uh, about giving our uh, president or chair of the board an increase, and, and we just feel that that creates a um, an issue between the members of the board. And um, I, I I just think that it's it's not a good idea to do that. I think every board member, even though the, the president has a burden, but I know I know you all rotate, and uh, we don't. But um, it, it's just my opinion that it would create an issue amongst the members. Maybe it would. Maybe this board would, would be okay with that. Maybe somebody on the next board would, and everybody wanted to be present. Well, so, uh, for that reason, I, I'm, I am not in favor of that part of that recommendation. Are you in favor of the other recommendation? Yes, yes I am. All right. Anything else? Commissioner Meinbold? No. Do you like a motion or a um, with that being said, I will accept a motion to approve the recommendations of the Salary Study Commission with the understanding of uh, the $1,500 increase to the President of the Board of Education uh, would be denied, um, but all Board of Education members would receive a $1,000 increase. So basically accepting the recommendations with that exception of the extra $500 for the president and board of education. Is that, is that what I heard you say? That's correct. All right, so if, uh, can I get a motion to that effect? I'll, I'll make the motion to that effect that we accept all of the recommendations with that one exception. All right, we have a motion, we have a second. Second. Motion to second, question or motion. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, motion carries. But congratulations. <laughs> I want to get it. <laughs> and uh, so now that we've decided on that, uh, at our next meeting, we'll actually pass the ordinance to make that official, although it is official now that we voted on it with the official particulars we'll be taking care of at the next meeting. Um, and, and once again, thank you uh, to the Salary uh, Study Commission and those members who volunteered uh, their time to be part of that. Um, that brings us to announcements. Uh, the only announcement uh, that I have, uh, the next scheduled public meeting is Monday, April the 5th. Uh, once again, the courthouse is now open. We are limited to the number of uh, folks that can attend. Uh, if you are interested in attending in person, uh, face coverings are required. Um, it'll be limited to approximately 15 people, first come, first serve. Uh, they'll have, you'll have to come in the main entrance, um, and, and then uh, they'll let people in about 10 minutes before the meeting. Um, anyone, and we'll continue to have meetings uh, this way via Zoom uh, or YouTube as well. Uh, and anyone that wants to make comments, uh, you can still send emails to gccomments at garrettcounty.org. Uh, the new protocol for uh, making comments in our meetings uh, due to a variety of reasons, we will have a sign up sheet and you'll have to come up front uh, and, and uh, make those comments uh, as well. So if there's any questions about that, you can email us or call in and speak to Mr. Nall. Uh, the last announcement I'll make, unless there's any other announcements from my esteemed colleagues. Um, what some of you may know, some of you may not know uh, or care, uh, I do as a history guy. Uh, next year will be the 150th anniversary of Garrett County becoming a county. Uh, we are the youngest county in the state of Maryland. Uh, and, and separated from Allegheny County uh, 149 years ago and 150 next year. Uh, to that end, uh, we will be formulating a committee 
to plan some uh, ceremonies and celebrations around that anniversary. Uh, so look for more to come on that. Uh, very preliminary stages of that right now, but a significant milestone in the history of our county next year. And we want to make sure that we give it the uh, attention that, that it deserves. So uh, be on the lookout for announcements on that. Uh, any other announcements uh, or questions or comments? Uh, what we'll do now is uh, in just a second, we'll adjourn uh, the meeting. Uh, so long as I get a motion to do so. And tonight is the beginning of our budget, uh, fiscal year 2022 budget presentations. Uh, tonight will be the Board of Education and, and welcome all of those members and staff and thank you all for coming. Um, and then we'll have a, a few more of these as we go and just a dialogue to talk about the needs of, of those particular groups. Again, tonight, the Board of Ed and uh, start looking at the budget moving forward for that. So before we go to the budget presentation and I'll turn it over to Superintendent Baker, uh, do we have a motion to adjourn the public meeting? So moved. All right, the uh, Tuesday, March 16th public meeting is adjourned. Thank you, Thank you again to our Thank presenters you. and visitors. Thanks for coming. Thank and uh, Ms. Baker, I'll turn it over to you. Okay. He said he had this on. Yeah, he said We've been here a while. Anybody want to water or anything? Yeah, I would love to water. Yeah, I should get it. Thanks, Kevin. I'll make it. Thank you. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. I think there might be coach back here, too. Or so is there. Kathleen? Ronnie? Uh, we're being broadcast, but I'm not, I don't have the uh, video right now. We are broadcasting that. Carol's way. You want anything in there? Carol's way. Don't shine that in anybody's eyes. I won't. <laughs> if I do it, it won't be yours. <laughs> <laughs> That's nice. <laughs> I need him to like every day. Yeah. Yeah. Not that I don't need you to. <laughs> it's, nice <laughs> it's nice if you have a good sense of humor. <laughs> we wouldn't know what to do without a major, to be honest. Pardon me? We wouldn't know what to do without a major. Yeah. Yeah. So, Kevin, just for clarification, is this going to be broadcast live then or just recorded? Or? It's being broadcast live now. I don't have the video for whatever reason. Will the uh, presentation from uh, the solar? Yes. Side, will that We're going to put that up. Yes. Yes. Is that a different company then, 142? Yeah. Yes. It's a different company. Oh. And I don't, I don't know what happened. We just lost the video feed and IT was in there trying to figure out what, it just dropped apparently. So the folks that are trying to listen, we look like we have 25 people in there. They can, they can listen, but they can't see. Well, yeah, I, 
I didn't touch anything, but that's beside the point. Yeah. 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 It should be. Did it work? Well, the laser is working, so I know it's working. Okay. It's just. All right. Hey, Tom, are you sitting back there by yourself or all oh, my friends back here? <laughs> <laughs> Keeping an eye on the uh, money. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, Kevin can just advance them. Well, can you advance them? Yeah, I can, I can advance them. Yeah, but see, it's, it's working. See, the little laser thing, it's working. But so the batteries, it just works enough. See, yours isn't changing. All right, let me get out. We have hard copies. We can yeah. get started. We can just tell someone to turn the page. Absolutely. It's not a problem. They're not numbers. So you just have to make sure you have the page. Quite no problem. So I'll go ahead and uh, go ahead and get started. Um, I do really want to thank the commissioners for this opportunity to present uh, on behalf of the Board of Education and DCPS. Uh, we did not get to come last year, as Mr. Edwards said, uh, because of the shutdown. Uh, but prior years, we did have this opportunity, and, and I really appreciate the dialogue between our two entities. Um, I was going to introduce all the board members to the folks that aren't here. You, we all know each other. Uh, I do want to introduce uh, Mr. Van Sickle as our newest board member, so welcome to Mr. Van Sickle. And then you know my colleague, uh, Mrs. Spitzer. Normally, the rest of my cabinet team comes to support us, but uh, we were asked to keep a limited number, so I'm sure they're here in spirit. And... Um, so we have a number of slides that um, kind of highlight uh, our year and are looking forward. And then I will turn it over to Mrs. Schweitzer for all of the um, numbers information, if you will. So we're on slide two, if, if, uh, if and when we're able to pull it up. And this really, this slide highlights um, our year, as you're well aware. Um, uh, last year was impacted greatly by the pandemic, and we were still moving our system forward. We did invest in science textbooks, uh, some curriculum for English and <coughs> arts. We did uh, a number of resources realigned to address student behavior issues, and the board did approve the final report of the Strategic Facilities Committee uh, prior to March. Then uh, when the uh, pandemic hit and the school system was closed, we began work on a continuity of learning plan and started transitioning our instructional services to a virtual model. Uh, we did have the, our food service uh, pivoted to a summer feeding model. You probably saw, oh, there we go. You probably uh, saw our summer feeding out and about uh, beginning in March. We're very proud of the fact that we were able to um, continue serving the students of Garrett County and their families. And then our 2020 financial highlights, um, about a half a million dollars in uh, fund balance for capital projects. Uh, we did have our food service fund uh, end with a bit of a deficit. And then our medical assistance balance ended the year down as well. Uh, some of those attributed to the, uh, the virus and some loss. Um, we did find through our work with Schoology and trying to start our continuity of learning and certainly our recovery plan, that we have about 28% of our students um, that do not have any access to the internet. Uh, we know that is a county issue, which is why I bring it to your attention. Um, it was a challenge for us, and you'll see it later in the slides as well. It was a challenge for us to stand up a virtual um, program. Uh, but we know we're all working together to improve that infrastructure for our families. Did I do it? Here we go. Yep. Okay. Okay. Perfect. 
Okay. Right. What was it? 28, about 28% that don't have access to internet at all. Uh, we did provide, I think you'll see it on, the, on this slide. Uh, we did provide hotspots and do some other things uh, to help, but um, it, it actually you'll see it there. Some of the federal funds that we so if you see the CARES Act funding, we did uh, very quickly stand up a summer program that was called Jumpstart. Uh, we did have an investment in that learning environment for professional development, student and staff devices, and the community and household hotspots. Um, we did um, go to a one-to-one -one so that all students have a device. They didn't all have a brand new device because just like everybody else in the United States, everybody was ordering hard, you know, everybody was ordering um, hardware and <laughs> devices. Um, but we were able to provide something, and now we're deploying all of our of our new ones. I do want to highlight um, the additional nurses and tech support. You'll see later that our nurses have been, and I, I did want to say something when Bob was there, and, and we've been great partners with the health department. Our school nurses have been, from the beginning, helping with uh, testing and also now helping with vaccinations. And I know that that partnership has always been strong, but through this, it has uh, become even stronger. Um, and you'll see that there under the community response. And then uh, we did reallocate some unrestricted funds. Uh, we we uh, went ahead and purchased the next phase of the elementary English language arts curriculum. We uh, were able to match state funding for security festivals at two schools, Accident and Rock Lakes. And then we deployed our custodian and maintenance staff to continue to provide additional cleaning and disinfecting in our schools. I just have a couple of uh, facts. This goes to what you were asking, uh, Mr. Heimbaugh. After we um, after we deployed all the hotspots, we still had about 10% of our students that had no internet at all. Uh, some of the hotspots didn't work, so it was still slow for a lot of folks. So that number did go down um, considerably. And we have spent about $1.9 million of the 2.8 that has been allocated to the in those federal funds. Uh, we also spent 271 nurse days that have been spent working collaboratively with the health department on that testing and vaccination for our community. I've told Bob several times that as soon as our kids come back, we'll need our nurses back. But right now we still are doing asynchronous learning on Wednesdays. So they are continuing to help um, on Wednesdays. And again, that has been a very good uh, partnership. I just wanna highlight as you all uh, I saw this evening, you know, everything continued during the pandemic with regular business plus all of the pandemic business. And we were the same for our uh, school system. Um, I know Mr. Edwards is very proud of this, so I included it in the slide. Uh, we continue to dominate the state in our CTE programs. Our, um, our JRTC was the very first one in the state to have a CTE complete, completer program, and that was accomplished last year. 100% uh, of our CTE students graduate, and we are only one of two counties that has reached 100% attainment of the recognized credentials uh, in some of our programs. Uh, and also, we're also very proud of the second uh, paragraph. Standing up that Schoology Learning Management System was a challenge. Uh, we didn't, uh, we knew at some point we would be going to some sort of virtual learning. But in a very short span of time, we got teachers together, administrators together to review a learning management system, to choose one, to purchase one, to all of the staff development and have it ready for implementation in a very short period of time. It wasn't without bumps along the way, along the road, but uh, you know, I think our teachers are really starting to be very good at it and our, our students are benefiting from this learning management system that we did purchase. All right, so this is uh, the beginning of the superintendent's budget initiatives for the upcoming school year 2021-2022, which is FY22. And it's three basic goals that I've reminded the board of uh, several times during our work uh, so far on our uh, budget cycle. And the first one is to accelerate academic achievement. We don't know 
um, exactly where our students will be when they return to us after being out of in-person learning in a very regular setting for, for a year, exactly as of March 13th, as Mr. Edwards said earlier, it's been exactly a year. And who would have guessed it would be this long or, or uh, this much of a challenge when we first uh, heard about the, the virus. But again, I think everybody in the school system, one thing that we have learned is that it does take all of us. It takes our finance department, it takes our food service department, our custodians to run the school system. And so when our students come back, uh, they came back yesterday. At, uh, anyone that wanted to come back, we were able to accommodate. But we do want to uh, really look a close look at where our students are when they come to us. And our first goal, okay. our first goal to accelerate academic achievement. We are able, even though we did have some decline in enrollment, we're very hopeful that those students come back to us. So we have tried not to cut any uh, teachers or instructional assistant positions so that we're prepared if the students come back, if and when they come back to us. Um, we have prioritized uh, instructional resources for the current system needs. And we are going to uh, be very diligent in braiding our federal and state funds together with our operating budget to ensure that we are providing the best academic environment for our students that we can when they come back to us in person, whether it be now or in the fall. The second is a very similar goal, and that is to address the social emotional well being of students. We know that some have experienced trauma while being at home for such a long period of time. We do uh, plan to introduce two new behavior coaches. We are planning to completely realign the behavior support department. And again, we will take the federal and state funds, make sure that we braid those together with our operating funds and our capital funds to get the most bang for our buck to address uh, social emotional well-being when our students return. And then finally, uh, continuing to, as I said earlier, to move our school system forward, uh, using our fund balance to um, implement the next phase of the board's strategic facilities plan and then replacing furniture, vehicles, things that we did have to defer from FY21 uh, will be put back into this budget. Okay, at this time, uh, we begin the numbers discussion. And so I'm going to turn it over to Mrs. Schweitzer uh, to start with the unrestricted budget reconciliation. So we'll go to the unrestricted budget first. And then we'll move to the capital. Um, so this is a representation that I do for the elect for the Board of Education every year, just to show the big additions and then the places where we have the subtraction so that you see the variances. So um, the increases this year come from our state aid and also what um, the elected board has requested from county maintenance of effort. Mr. Weeks and I have been discussing because the legislation has been changing. Um, we believe that it'll continue, it may continue to change, but at this point, um, we, are, we are requesting uh, maintenance of effort of $28,454,593. Um, there's also, um, Two, two areas of decreasing from our revenue, um, the designated facilities funding, and that was the QZAB program through the IAC, and that went away. Um, and then also the local prior year balance uh, amount that the board is electing to you, or the superintendent is proposing to use. Um, in FY19 and FY20, um, there was $600,000 of the board's fund balance that was used to supplement revenue. And it, it last year, um, we pulled that back to 485,000. And so this year we're pulling it back um, to about 71,000 to be able to right size the revenue with the amount that the board is actually receiving from its funding sources. So this is a representation when you um, combine the unrestricted and the restricted um, to, for the overall operating revenue uh, by source, you'll see that um, 
the county government is the largest contributor to the Board of Education's budget. And we thank you very much for that. Um, next is the state. And then this year we do have, um, we're estimating 9.6% being federal funds. And that is actually going to increase with the ESSER 3 that um, just was passed. Um, so we'll be following that. Okay, and so then here's the expenditure side. And we have the same model here of the big um, additions to the superintendent's proposed budget and also the large um, decreases. So the contractual salary increases, um, that accounts for substitute rates that must increase because of minimum wage continuing to increase. Um, any of those um, teachers who receive longevity or move from um, standard professional to an advanced professional or any of our staff that earn any degrees that um, make them eligible for any add to basis. There's an increase for contracted services. That's our licenses, our insurance. Um, it's very difficult um, to not um, have any cost of living increases with contracted services. The compensation parameters that the board um, approved are right at $576,187. And then we also were able to propose reintroducing um, the purchase of a vehicle and the, the furniture rotation allocation, which were two areas that we had pulled out in FY21 um, to defer. Well, so the compensation parameters, the 576, is that based on a percentage pay raise for everybody? What, what, what is that? It is a percentage increase, but it is it's not just salary, it's also health insurance too. So it's a full benefit package. Okay. So it's not just a it's not just a percentage. Okay. I'm just trying to understand what what percent pay increase did you all give last year? Well, we negotiate with four bargaining right. units. Yeah. <laughs> so, it wasn't the same. Um, so it's not the same for each. Um, Roughly order of magnitude, what was the lowest or the highest? Do you, do it, it was right around 3%. Okay, thank you. Oh. Sorry, I didn't mean the 30 Well, but, but the, one of the reasons that it, it really had to be 3% was to qualify for the state match for the teacher salary incentive. Yeah, I, I, I understand. So, that was that. So then um, the, the big decreases are the last salary, which is where you have a more seasoned population retiring and you hire someone that is lower on the pay scale. 537,000 is our estimate for that. Um, the state designated capital improvements that, that QZAB um, that we saw on the revenue side. And then the, also the elementary reading resources. So that had been a two phase land purchase. Since we reallocated in, F, in the current fiscal year to purchase Next year's with our our budget variance from um, from the current fiscal year, we were able to take that planned purchase out, um, and that gets us to the fifty one million seven hundred ten thousand eight hundred ninety nine dollar um, expense number that matches the revenue. Um, So here we have um, the superintendent's proposed budget by category, uh, side by side uh, when you compare the prior year's approved budget to this year's um, proposed. Administration did increase about 26,000 or 2%, and that's driven by the increase in the contracted services and also the negotiations placeholder. Mid-level um, administration increased about $30,000, and that's the same. Um, instruction decreased um, by about 122,000, and that was driven by that elementary reading series that we removed from the budget. Special ed and special education and pupil services all had reductions due to lap salary, 
as well as there's one special ed position that has been reallocated to instruction for behavioral needs. Fixed charges are down slightly. And then we have the pie chart here that shows that 39.1% of the proposed unrestricted budget by category is in instruction. So here we have the representation of the side-by-side -side by object. Um, salaries overall in this proposed budget are a 1% increase. Um, the contract and services are down. And that is driven by the work that's not happening through those QZAB projects the, um, that we discussed with the revenue and the expense being pulled out. The supplies and materials are down um, about 17%, and that's attributed to the purchase of the elementary reading series. Um, equipment is up about 12%, and that's because we are we put back in that vehicle. Um, and the fixed charges are the same as the prior. Can, can we ask questions as we, as we go or do prefer? Sure, yeah, I'd like to ask them while you go. I'm just curious. Um, Salaries didn't really go up that much, but under current salaries are going to go up significantly. When will that get? What year? When will we begin seeing that? Well, I think it'll it'll depend on this Kerwin 2.0 bill, House Bill 1472. Um, but it it sounds like it won't it won't be at least until next fiscal year that we see um, those. This concepts materializing and finding out what is really a suggestion and what's a requirement. <laughs> so, so it's too early to tell what your increase in salaries might be. Okay, thank you. I'm not trying to pick at you. I'm just trying no, to. No, I have a okay. question. How we go? Yeah. <laughs> okay, so here we have the pie chart by object. And um, I say this a lot, but we are in the people business. So 58% of the overall budget is, is in salaries. Um, and then the next largest slice is fixed charges. So those staff members benefit. So back to, back to me. Uh, you know, we really do want to um, talk some about the capital programs, the school construction update. Uh, you know, we think we're going to be in a very good um, place with uh, school construction. The Built to Learn Act uh, has changed. And for this FY22, our split will still be the 89-11, uh, but it looks like in FY23 and 24, that goes to 90-10. And then um, we're all we've been really looking forward to the allowable costs uh, for state participation expanded, the AME, the architecture design portion, which is sometimes was um, so great that we couldn't do a project. So if that is able to be um, at the state level, that will be extremely helpful for our work on projects. And then you are aware of the strategic facilities committee final report. Uh, the board did accept the report and approve it. Uh, we do have 125,000 of the fund balance allocated right now to a feasibility study. And we have also, because we know that we will be having upcoming projects right now, we've reallocated a position to be a, a coordinator of projects and oversee parts of the maintenance department. That's, um, that will help uh, uh, coordinate and manage uh, projects that while we're under this um, really uh, great split for us that's no longer 50 50 so we're hoping that we can get a lot of projects completed if, if i can jump in there for a minute um because it can't be overstated the the accomplishment of changing the cost formula for garrett county in the state of maryland is monumental absolutely and the senator and delegate get a lot of credit as they should because without them it wouldn't have happened but this group of people in this room right here as well as a lot of business people out there 
put a lot of, of, of heart, sweat, and tears into to that as well. And it was a Garrett County effort, and I want to specifically thank you all for your work on that and my partners for their work on it and anyone out there that because there were a lot of people it wasn't just the elected people in the case a lot of people that uh worked on this and what i don't think a lot of people understand is we are the only county to get change so it really was a garrett county initiative which is unbelievable when you step back and think about it you're talking tens of millions of dollars. It is. It, it's it's it un, and and we really and I know you all know this and and agree and I think we do as well. We got we got to be ready to move and take advantage of it. But uh, I, I do want to just publicly thank everybody, uh, especially our delegation, but everyone that had a hand in this because it is it's still astonishing to me that we were able to pull this off. Me too. And you're right, it cannot be overstated. Uh, when it was 50 50, uh, you know, our ability to do major projects was uh, severely hindered. And now we're hoping, as Mr. Edwards said, to really be able to move this forward. And um, I believe it piggybacks, piggybacks Allegheny. So as long as they're in this range, that is what our range will be. So we know at least the next few years. And we do really uh, thank Senator Edwards and Delegate Beisel, and of course, everyone here and you three as well, uh, because it, it, it is a monumental feat and we're very pleased. And so we hope we're positioning ourselves well to be able to um, really get some projects done in the very near future. And you'll see the next, you'll see the next kind of pie chart that we included uh, that uh, both Mrs. Schweitzer and I found very interesting. If you look at fiscal year 2020, uh, the state, um, put in about 44%, the, the county put in a, a 6.5, and we used our fund balance. So in 2020, knowing and hoping that we would be moving to this 90 or 89, 11, 90, 10, you know, the, the, the Board of Education collectively helped themselves to get some projects going. And then in fiscal 21, the state is putting in a large portion, but now the county put in 38%, which we're very uh, appreciative as, of, as well. And then if you look at 2022, now the state of Maryland is putting in uh, a large chunk. He, then the county government chunk has gone down and then our, our fund balance will be a very small portion, but we'll be able to get a lot more accomplished uh, with these cost share percentages. So I think it is, as Mr. Edwards said, it's all of us working together. Some years we put in it more, some years we put in more, but we're very thankful for that. So we did include some pictures because we're so proud of some of the work that has been done. Um, I don't think this would look any more lovely, the front facade of Southern High School with the new portico and the windows. It has completely changed the look of Southern Garrett High School. Uh, this is down by the gymnasium doors. Those are new doors there. And then you'll see a close up of the windows and the brickwork and how nice that looks. And then this is at night, uh, the portico uh, at Southern Jared High School. And it, it, it just is, is lovely. And we're so thankful to everyone for their work on those projects. Uh, this is the Accent Elementary School cafeteria. Right now it is being used as a classroom so that we can keep everybody physically distanced. And I have to say it's the nicest classroom at Accident Elementary School right now because this new tile and the walls is absolutely stunning when you look at Accident Elementary School. It has been such an improvement to the cafeteria. And there's a lot of work that has been done at Accident to make this look very similar throughout the hallways. That has been very nice as well. This is Northern Garrett High School. This is the new media center. I believe it was carpeted and that was taken out. And this is a new tile that was put in. And uh, this was taken, obviously no furniture has been put back yet, uh, but you can see how nice that looks at Northern Garrett. Uh, we've been partnering for several years with the County Roads Department. Um, and we thank you for that as well. Uh, that's been a good partnership because they helped us pave the Hickory, uh, which was a very kind of um, uh, gravel road back through Hickory, and now it's paved. And then we widened the bus loop at Hickory so that buses could get around. And then we have a space there now for uh, 
uh, disabled parking as well that we needed for many years at Hickory. So we're thankful for that partnership as well. Uh, this picture I included because this is our field dedication. And as we said, we are thanking uh, both Senator Edwards and Delegate Beisels in this photo. Uh, this was the night we dedicated Northern Andy Warner. Uh, this is Andy Warner, I won't let it get right back here. Uh, Mrs. Doughton, who is uh, on the foundation and a longtime board member. I'm not sure what happened, why we didn't get the rest of the board members that were there that evening. I did lose all my pictures again on my phone, so I probably had one, but I wasn't able to find one. But we have all three commissioners in this picture, and thank you very much for all of your work uh, helping us get more than high school sealed. Um, the board members were there that evening, but I, I'm sorry I didn't get a picture. Uh, but then this is uh, Northern's field from above, and this is Southern's field from above. And um, again, I, I think that was a result of the work of everybody in this room to collaborate and uh, get these projects completed. That will be virtually maintenance free for a number of years once we get everything completed. Uh, and I, I think it's something to be very proud of. Um, at, at each of our high schools. So uh, construction coming up for this year for FY22. Uh, we do want to make some additional improvements at Northern Garrett High School. Um, the HVAC, as we as systems age out, we are uh, replacing those systems with air conditioning. Um, we also, it's very uh, badly needed to improve the parking lot lighting and paving at Northern Garrett High School. And then we have a mechanical uh, boiler replacement there as well. This is the 19,000 for right now for the AME for that project. I do wanna talk a little bit about the Grantsville Elementary open space conversion and thank you all again for helping us to uh, get this project moving forward. Uh, as most of you know, I was principal at uh, Grantsville Elementary School for three years. And uh, it was at the time when there was an increase in school shootings, there was an increase in school uh, in, uh, faith focus on safety. And each time our safety people and our, our maintenance people would stand up and say, the best way to protect you is to lock your doors. And I would say, not only don't we have locks, we don't have doors. And it was, it is an opening and it's, it was unsafe. It is a project that has been needed to be done for a number of years to keep our students in Drensville safe. And I'm very excited. Uh, we will be presenting to the board next month. We had a lot of preliminary work to do first, um, but we are moving forward with that project. Uh, hopefully if nothing goes wrong with the pandemic and the current regulations, if so, we have to punt and, and look at it in another way. Uh, but I'm very excited about that project and, and thank you again. And also we have a mechanical uh, boiler replacement at uh, Loop 40 that will need to be done as well. Um, so our total request for capital is down from the previous year um, of, our, of our budgeted amount and our approved spending uh, from last year as well in construction. And then, did you have anything you want to add with construction and anything that comes to the board? And open it up to any questions or anything that the board members might want to add to the presentation as well. We can take any other questions. Well, before you jump in, I just want to point of clarity. I don't know, are we still on this? It's yeah, are, are, are we live? Yeah. Is, so if there's audience out there. Yeah, we're audio, but you're live. Okay. Yes. All right. I, I know um, having talked with some uh, of the board members and Director Schweitzer and Director Weeks for us, and, and uh, because there's a notion out there maybe that the, from some members of our county that the Board of Ed and the commissioners don't get along all that great or go back and forth with each other. I, I would say that's not true. I appreciate the relationship and we meet quite often. But what I'm saying is there was a thought even a week ago or two weeks ago because of some things the governor put out that some funding might happen a certain way and that all changed. So we're, you might hear things tonight or 
next week or the next week that are a little different than what was said at the board of ed meeting or whatever that's not anybody pulling the wool over anybody's eyes or misleading things change matter of fact i think they just changed yesterday uh so the the budget meeting at the board of ed uh was presented one way and it's going to be different but we're aware of that and it's because the the laws that are going through the legislature are changing the way things are being asked and and how they have to be funded so i just want to level make sure everybody understands that so nobody thinks anybody's trying to do anything uh you know whatever but we're everyone on here is on the same page we understand what the state is doing we understand there's still possible legislation that could happen that could change this yeah. even further. Uh, but I just want to make sure everybody knows that we're all on the same page and that there's no uh, yeah. misunderstandings or misrepresentations. Yeah. This is the same dynamic in every, in every school system that the, that the Board of Ed is usually one of the highest um, funded schools in the state. So it's see the friction that occurs in uh, other jurisdictions between the Board of Ed and, and county commissions, the county council, whatever. So I absolutely agree. I, I, I don't think that means that we can't uh, differ on things or ask questions or challenge some things. And so that's kind of where I'm coming from. I, I, I have a series of questions. I'll get to them quick. I, 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 I have a point. I have a reason to ask these. And, uh, do you know yet how much money you're going to get additional money you're going to get through the federal the COVID bill and the state and all that kind of stuff i mean it's i i yes. i know what i read it's millions and millions of dollars right. I, do you right. have a number so, yet? so the sr2 which is the piece the second recovery piece that we're actually working on the proposal right now that's just shy of four million dollars and that um, is is um, estimated in the restricted portion of the superintendent's proposed budget. So we allocated for that. Now that is um, the time period for that is through September of 2023. So, or yes, 2023. So we have time to spend that. And, and it's really supposed to be spent right. as the icing for recovery over a, a period of time because you're not going to be able to to do to make all of the strides, whether it's academic or behavior intervention or um, the nursing support, um, the the devices, the IT support. You know, we, we need time to sure. to to do that. So, Allison, I think. I was talking to the Mako staff trying to get an answer to this and several other people were asking about their counties and um, I don't have it exactly right, but, but the number they were throwing around that was between the state and the federal government that we might get as much as $12 million over what we were getting before. So I don't know. Right, so we are, um, there was, we, we just received the fiscal note for House Bill 1372. And they're um, very, everyone is very concerned about understanding what school systems are using this money for, yeah. how much they're getting, whether they're supplanting or is it really extra. And actually, I was talking with Mrs. Baker because there was a chart in here that actually had what our SR3 funding was. And this was the first I had seen it. And it could be as much as 
another piece of almost nine million dollars. Okay, so that's and, kind of consistent. Right. right, and so what what this fiscal note is saying is that Garrett County Public Schools should receive close to thirteen point nine million dollars from all all. I understand, in. and you don't need to go into a lot of detail about. Uh, I know the the point I want the point being is you're going to get a whole lot of extra money. That's the point I want to bring up. Now, what the restrictions are on use and all that kind of stuff, I don't know. Well, and, and if you, if I could, Mr. Humboldt, and both the first goal and the second goal, both the last bullet, where we're we're looking to braid those restricted okay. funds the best that we can, so that we use the recovery for recovery, and yeah. then we're able to use the operating for anything that we cannot. Be and I think that's great. I was going to get. I didn't know what braid was until you that's started. That's what it meant. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Using uh, every dollar to the best of our ability. So, well, really the point being is that you're that you're going to get a whole lot of extra money. Um, I know there are people that disagree with me, but you have a decline in enrollment. Sure. I know there's going to be this influx of people coming in and all that sort of thing. Um, your capacity utilization is I don't know 55, 60 percent or something. Like that. You have a lot of space you're not using. My, my concern is that I was looking forward, I'm going to be very candid, I was looking forward to being able to put some, uh, to, I don't want to say pressure, work with you all to try to um, maybe come up with a plan to try to do some consolidation and, and develop some efficiencies where you don't have all this space you don't need and you spend money on bricks and mortar and utilities and other things rather than on classroom instruction. Now, let me also, I agree with Paul, and he, he, he is a good advocate for you all in that, you know, I'm very proud of the school system here. We're all products of the school system, and two of us have done pretty well, so, you know, we're, we're happy with that, you know, so. But here, here, here's, my, here's my concern. You know, you're going to have a lot of extra money, millions of dollars. We've gone from 50-50 to 90-10. So... Our leverage with you all before was on the capital side. <laughs> we could say to you, we're not funding that because 50% of it was coming from us. Well, now it's only 10%. I, I, I think there's I, two things. I think there's a great opportunity here with the, all the extra money you have and the 90-10 thing. I, I, I think there's a great opportunity to make some really strategic moves and to jump ahead 10 or 15 years. I don't think we're going to do that. I think because we're now in 9010 and you have all this extra money, there's no pressure to do anything. I think what we've done is we just, we're committed to status quo. There's not going to be any changes. I would predict there won't be any significant changes. Like, for example, there's money in here for a boiler for Route 40. Yeah. I'm not a teacher. I'm not, but I don't think we need Route 40. With the upgrade to Grantsville, so why are we spending money? And, and, and that's the frustrating part for me. And, and what I see is a great opportunity. All this money, the nine and ten. You know, if we could just think strategically and be bold and do some things to put us where we're going to be in ten or fifteen years, this is a one once in a generation opportunity. But I don't think we're going to take advantage of it because we don't have to anymore because. You can get capital for 9010, you get all this extra money. So there's no there's no pressure right, right. to do the kind of things that well, you I, know, I think those are very those are very valid points. One one uh, you know, one thing this budget proposed budget does not have is a lot of major changes or cuts or some consolidations because we're very hopeful that some of the students that left us will come back. So we left the we we, we tried to develop a budget that would account for that. Now if they don't, and our, and our enrollment does continue to decline, some years much more steeply than others. And last few, it's been a little bit more stable. But this board has made a commitment to maintaining community schools. So we haven't moved forward with consolidations. I'm sure that uh, they can certainly be considered by this board at some point. But with, you know, they have made that commitment to maintain community schools. Denzel and Route 40 is a community. Uh, we're, we're, I think Grantsville, when it gets finished, is going to be an absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. wonderful facility and much needed. Yeah. Uh, but I think they've, we've kind of said we'll cross that bridge and, you know, 
I don't think we'll be able to do as many projects. We don't we don't have the infrastructure to just start doing all kinds of things with the 9010. So we have to be very strategic in how we assign those projects. But, uh, and but I'll, you know, I'll let the elected board weigh in. But you know, no, I'm not. I'm, I'm not really. I, I don't think because of what I said, anything is right, going right. to change. I think we look at but, it. But but even general. if all the students do come back, they're still at 55 percent utilization. If, if they all come back, so it's not. Right. You know, it's just. It, I. I my only concern is it's going to be a missed up. It's we're, we're going to miss an opportunity. Well, remember they're not all fifty-five because we do have an issue with an equity a little bit because some of the southern elementary schools are much at higher capacity than our northern elementary. I understand. But I, you know, one of the things that would be interesting, and I, I guess you don't know for sure right now, but with all this money that you're getting, it, is there can some of that be used for capital? I mean, can that be used to put a library for yeah. Friendsville? It's, in the friends well, not that, but the ESSER 2 and even the ESSER 3 can be used for um, air quality issues that, that we're, we're looking at. So, so like all the filtration systems can be replaced. Oh. And, and so that's like the, it's right. not a, a fun thing. It, like people don't see it and you can't, it's hard to talk about, it's but, but state it's expensive. No, yeah. <laughs> so, I understand, but, but, but that kind of makes my point. Yeah. Or spend money improving air quality in places you don't really need. So that, that's all. I had to get it off my chest. I'll say the same thing again next year, I'm sure, and then I'll be gone. And well, you don't have to worry about it. So. <laughs> I, I think you make some very valid points. I agree. Mr. Wood. Yeah, I, I think, uh, uh, Mr. Honorable, I think this board is open to looking at many of those things you just, you just mentioned. We are committed to community schools. That doesn't mean that there are opportunities to do things that don't impact communities. Uh, I, I would I would say this: it's a good thing we have all that space today. We wouldn't have schools open because we're using every ounce of space we got, every inch, every inch of every building we use uh, to keep kids in school. So the, the guy is a blessing right now. now. Obviously, we're hoping we're not all wearing masks this time next year, but there's no assurances that we're not going to. Um, but, but I, I, you know, I, I think, you know, certainly once we see the head specs at Southern Middle and Rockford and we do a feasibility study, I think you know, we, we're going we're gonna, to, we are, we are committed to doing one thing, that is looking to the future, not tomorrow, but looking to the future. <laughs> this, this won't happen again. No, and, 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 and in our lifetimes. No, I know, Tom. And, and the danger is when you have all the money now to do that, five, six, seven, eight years from now, the likelihood that you have all this right. money to maintain a lot of infrastructure right. as salaries go up. And there's only, you know, I mean, your operating money still comes largely from us. Right. So, Absolutely. you know, that's all. I just yeah. needed to get my opinion on things. Valid points. Thanks for your patience and understanding. We too, brother. <laughs> um, yeah. I, I think there is. Opportunity we, we didn't have before with the Build to Learn Act, and, and the A and E that's 100 percent county funding yeah, that's a may change now, and that changes the way we look at a lot of these problems. Mm -hmm. So I think Tom is right just a minute looking at uh, being strategic and actually utilizing money. But, but you know what we're seeing right now is a game changer for education, not only in the state of Maryland, but specifically for Bear County, and we really have to take advantage of all this. And I, and I agree with Commissioner Edwards 110 percent. You know, we are a great uh, debt of gratitude to uh, Senator Edwards and Delegate, particularly Senator Edwards. The stuff he's been able to do with the money for the fields, the 9010. I mean, I, 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 I think the problem is the general public doesn't under, just doesn't understand or appreciate what a big deal that is and how somebody from a little Republican county is able to do that in a Democrat-dominated legislature. It's, I mean, that's just, it's remarkable, it really is, and I, I get frustrated because I, I don't think, uh, well, I think George doesn't get enough credit for doing those kind of things. Well, there was no it's other funding source for that, so if it wasn't that, if we didn't get it, we would have never been able to do that, and that's why I included it in the, in the PowerPoint, because it, it's just phenomenal, but really, they're awesome projects. And I guess I'll close by saying, I, 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 again, I agree we have a terrific 
school system. What we have now is an opportunity to make it really, really something special. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My pleasure. I'm sure. <laughs> Are there any other questions? you have any other questions? All right. Uh, first off, I'd like to just bring you all to the board and everything. When this all started, uh, I can't imagine um, the difficulties you had making a lot of decisions you had to make. I mean, when to close schools and, and how to get the virtual learning going, that had to be a momentous task. And uh, hopefully, Barb kind of alluded to this earlier, but hopefully when the kids all really get back in school and, and uh, find out how well this either did or didn't work, I, I, in the long run, I think it worked as good as it could do. I really do. Um, I'm going to echo a little bit of what Jim said. Um, we have, you all have a tremendous opportunity now. Grantsville School, I think that's absolutely just a must. It's a, it's a tremendous thing to get that done. And, um, you know, and then just look at this funding formula. Um, it's uh, it's an opportunity that we may not have very long. I don't know. I don't know how long it'll be until it's taken away. And I, I hope it lasts forever, but I'm afraid it won't. Um, so we do need to take advantage of it. Um, as I, I would almost have to think as far as the two football fields, and I'm not sure why Coach Woods hasn't applied for a coaching job again just to get back to the side of the field. When they make it the uh, more sure. accessible. <laughs> <laughs> I, I tell you, they, they are absolutely fabulous. And, and like I said about Senator Edwards, and getting this money for those fields, a tremendous, tremendous job. And, um, and we'll do just, another just what a, at Southern as well. Like when we open an asset field. for this county. I mean, these. I'm just hoping that the kids get to play this year. Me, on too. Me too. I mean, I really do. So, uh, you know, thank you all for being here today and presenting this. And, you know, we do, uh, we do appreciate it. Thanks. Well, let, let, let me just echo this board president, I guess, <laughs> the, the, the relationship that we do have. I, you know, I've, I've been doing this more than anybody. I've been in education here at Cal for 40 years now in some capacity. And I will say this. I, I'll, I'll say this truthfully. I don't think there's probably ever been a better working relationship with the county commissioners and the county board than this right now. You know, I think we all have respect for each other. As Jim said, we, we may not agree on everything, but we respect each other's decisions. That's all you can do. But, but uh, we appreciate very deeply the fact that we know we can come to you with, with honest problems and realists have to listen to them. So thank you on behalf of all of us. Hmm. Anybody have anything else? Any other questions, comments, concerns? No, thank you again for the opportunity. Any more questions? questions? Is, Anybody want to drill out while she's here? I'm just here. Just I'm here. Just here. I'm sorry, Alice. I didn't mean to pick. I didn't really mean to pick. Uh, she's used to it. No, she is used to it. She, we are both used to it. We get our money's worth every day. Yeah. 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 I know she can handle it. We do. Well, thank you, and, and thank you very much for everything. Um, we'll do our best to, I can't, I can't stress enough how much I want to get our kids back to a regular situation. So hopefully we will. Thank you so much. All right, thank you guys very much. Thank you. I have one question. Yes, yes go right ahead. ahead. You know, in the state of Maryland, when we think of like the well formula, and it kind of goes by utilities and all that, it's a, a good thing that we've had a lot of real estate in the past year and it's all that. Do you think in time that's going to impact where we are in the wealth formula with, you know, maybe with a significant increase in real estate property here? Will we see that affect things? I How think it's a, a definitely a legitimate question. I think time will tell because the way the, the way that that formula has changed some and how all this, once these bills go through, and I'll be the first to tell you, I haven't followed it quite as closely as uh, I have in the past for a variety of reasons. But if, if it stays based on property tax collection as the primary unit, then yes, that's going to impact us probably negatively for that particular 
indicator as we move forward. Um, how, uh, you know, but the, I guess the flip side of that one would argue if you didn't live in Garrett County is you're collecting a lot more money and then you can use that money uh, from a county perspective. Um, so it, it, you know, it's always going to be that particular piece is always part of the catch 22 of, of wealth, really. Um, but, but it's I, also in relation to all the other counties. So whatever's happening right. in Carroll, you know, right. it could, even though it's increasing for us, relatively speaking, it may not be increasing That's as right. much yeah. as other counties. Yeah. Yeah. And, and yeah, tying the capital out was big for that right. reason, because that's what prevents us from being able to do just a slight, simple roof job that you know, could cost you significantly more money, let alone a full rebuild. Yeah, right. That's good. I mean, that, that, that's been the battle we fought and the concern we've had for a long time, right? Absolutely. For sure. Now, will the solar panels make any? Will they... I, I don't know that uh, individually that project would move the needle that much on the actual well formula for the school, but it's certainly a drop. I mean, it's a, a drop in the bucket and drops fill the bucket. So it's, mm -hmm. it's part of the, it's part of the issue. Um, but I, I I think that particular project is a uh, is a good project, and it, it's going to be a benefit, I think, to your county. I do too. I want to drive down there with it, with the matches. It's yeah. where that project is going to be really interesting. All right. Well, thank you all very much. All right. Thank you. Appreciate thank you.